Does it matter if your name is Montague or Capulet? Shakespeare would say a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. What if it's Lannister or Stark? What if your blood determined who lived and who died? For rabbits, this just might be the case. For rabbits, family matters. You all know that rabbits are one of our, among our most major pests. They uh, cause around $200 million worth of losses every year to our agricultural industry. And their predilection for uh, eating our, the shoots of our, most, of our native and most palatable plants has put a lot of those species under threat and in turn uh, the, our native animals which rely on those plants for their nutrition or habitat. Uh, introducing Mixo and the Khaleesi virus in turn have both been wildly successful, uh, producing knockbacks of up to 95% for different rabbit populations. However, we know that the rabbits have been uh, developing genetic resistance, first to Mixo and more recently to RHTV. The good news is the virus is, is also evolving, but we don't know who's winning the arms race. And the question then is raised, well, if the rabbits are developing genetic resistance, and we have seen rabbits' uh, populations rising in the last few years, is the genetic resistance causing the rising populations, or is it some other factor? And this is what I'm trying to find out as part of my PhD. My goal is to determine just how much influence genetics is having on uh, rabbit numbers as compared to other environmental or just completely random factors. To do this, what I've been doing is building a great big family tree of a large population of rabbits uh, just near Gawla. And the idea here is that different families within this population will carry slightly different uh, genes through their lines. And if genetics is having a really large effect, then we'd expect different families to have different success rates when it comes to actually raising their offspring and bringing them to maturity. In order to do this, I've uh, been piggybacking onto the existing long-term capture, mark recapture project at the field site. So I went along for a year and uh, took little hole punch snips of the rabbit ears, brought those little bits of tissue uh, back into the lab where I've extracted the DNA and had it sequenced. We then get back the results, quality filter it because uh, DNA sequencing is quite error prone. And then the idea from here is to test uh, how closely the genetics of the different rabbits actually compares to each other. Because you inherit your genes from your parents, the more closely the, the genetics of, of any two rabbits are, the more closely related they are. And we can use this to figure out which offspring are matched with which parents. So what does our pedigree look like? Here it is in all its messy glory. Don't worry, I don't expect you to be able to read anything of that. It just shows how complex the system is. There's around 15 warrens on the site and there's a lot of interbreeding going on. Thankfully, we can pare this down to just a subset of rabbits that are of interest to us at a given time. For you today, I've brought warren 7. And uh, on warren 7 here, you can see the uh, orange lines show maternal relationships, while the blue lines are the fatherhood. So we have a dominant female up there with all the orange lines pointing to it. I think she's 2993. And she's more or less the matriarch of the warren. And there's also the dominant male, 2701. You can see that while they predominantly breed together, she's not strictly monogamous. A few other guys have had a go in there. <laughs> You'll also notice that among their second gen, their offspring there, only a couple of them have actually survived to breeding age themselves. Most of them are just genetic dead ends. They bred, they died, probably when they were two months old or something. But they have had one success story. One of their sons there has actually migrated to a neighbouring warren, which we call 9A, and he's been really successful himself in producing a lot of offspring. The question is, what was so magic about him? Obviously, there's a lot of randomness involved in who lives and who dies, but can we figure out the... Uh, a magic subset of factors that makes certain rabbits more prone to survival while others are much more likely to die early. Is it a matter of timing? One of my key hypotheses is that a rabbit's birthday is actually really important for whether or not it survives. And the reason that I think this might be the case is that um, very young rabbits we know are actually quite resistant to RHDV. So if they, get, if they are exposed to the virus within their first few weeks of life, uh, instead of getting sick and dying, they actually uh, recover and become immune, much like when we get chickenpox. They're then immune for the rest of their life. One of their uh, key threats is gone, and they're quite likely to survive and reproduce themselves. 
On this, at this site, the virus always comes through in spring, usually August to October kind of time. And you can see that uh, on this chart, the, so the blue lines are our rabbit deaths. And the rabbits who were born in July and August have the most chance of actually coming through and surviving. And they're the ones who will be about the right age when the virus comes through uh, in order to actually be relatively immune and, and make it through. So data so far actually pretty well supporting my hypothesis there. You'll also notice that from November through to February, there are hardly any rabbit births at all. We've got a sample size of one and five and nothing for January and December. But e even all of those that were born, they just die. Part of the reason of that may well be that by the time they get round to the outbreak later in the year, they're well and truly old enough to be fully susceptible. But also a likely cause of that is just the weather. Over summer, it's far too hot and dry and it's a really bad time to be a baby rabbit. Timing doesn't explain it all, though. So after all, most rabbits are born around the same time. Perhaps it's something more to do with who your parents are. Well, you can see here from this chart that uh, almost all of our young rabbits who actually uh, make it to survive to reproductive age themselves come from just a very few of our adult rabbits. The vast majority of our breeding adult rabbits have zero offspring that actually make it. Sure, they're churning out babies, but none of those babies are going anywhere. They're basically a waste of time. When I had a look at which of our rabbits were actually the ones producing successful offspring, it turns out that they're mainly the older rabbits on our site, the ones who've been around for a couple of years. And that's pretty much in line with what the literature and other field observations have shown. Rabbits have a, quite a social dominance hierarchy, so it makes sense that the older, more dominant rabbits They've got a much better time of it. They've got access to the better food, the better warrens. They can outcompete all the other rabbits. Makes sense that they would have a better time of actually uh, bringing their offspring uh, to maturity. And what I can show you here is that it's not just a matter of pushing out a ton of babies. Quality also has an impact, not just quantity. So we've got the orange lines here are the proportion of rabbits that survived, while the blue lines are for each the same adult the total number of offspring that they had. You can see among our biggest producers, one of them, he's quite the stud, Rabbit 3002. Uh, he had 16 offspring, which is the most out of all the ones recorded in my study. Not a single one of them survived. So it's just not just a matter of uh, qual quantity. Quality also comes into it. What might affect the quality of offspring? Well, genes might have something to do with it. Everything I've shown you so far basically fits in with what other field studies in the past, in Europe and a little bit in Australia, have shown uh, with regards to rabbit demographics. Where things will get really interesting is where, when I combine this with survival analysis based on the long-term turret field database. Using that database, we'll be able to first determine from an offspring's perspective whether or not it was fit did it survive to 1,500 grams, which is about the size that we'd expect a wild rabbit to start breeding. Once we combine that data set with the parentage that I've got from the sequencing database, then we can find out from the adult's perspective a truer measure of fitness. How many of your offspring did you have that actually made it themselves to maturity? With this measure of fitness, we can test its correlations between the factors that we think might actually be having an impact on whether the rabbits are surviving or not their genetics, the, war the size of the warren that they came from, the age and do dominance of their parents, the month of birth, as I explained earlier, or perhaps the maternal antibody titer. A mother can pass on antibodies to the viruses uh, through her milk to her offspring for the first few weeks of their life, and that could give them an extra boost to make it through. Looking at these correlations, we'll be able to partition the impact of these factors and uh, figure out just which ones are the most important. With that importance, that will give us targets for future rabbit control. If genetics looks like it turns out to be the most important thing, then, and in particular genetic resistance to RHDV, then bringing in new strains to help combat the resistance to pre-existing strains might be one of the best things we can possibly do. On the other hand, if the timing of the strains turns out to be more important, then looking at the timing in which we lay virus baits might actually give us a much better impact. This part of the study is actually underway right at this moment. So unfortunately, it'll be a couple of months until I can tell you exactly which of the factors is most impactful. But watch this space, because hopefully it's coming soon. Really thankful to all my supervisors and collaborators. 
uh, who've given me a lot of advice throughout the project, and especially the Foundation for Rabbit Free Australia and the Invasive Animals CRC, uh, without whose support this couldn't have happened. Should do. Um, so, for context, one of our other colleagues, Nina, has found a few spots in the genome of rabbits which are significantly correlated with genetic resistance. So, they're sort of potential resistance hotspots in the genome. I've actually used a very similar sequencing method to her. So, a number of the spots that I've sequenced in the genome should match up with hers. And so, there's a very good chance that I'll be able to trace them back and figure out if those specific genes are having an impact here as well. Uh, there are freeze-dried baits. I think freeze-dried ones have just been put through the approval process, and I can't remember the bait form that's currently out there, but definitely uh, baiting does happen. Currently, just with the old virus, and the, the field strains actually evolved and got better since the old one, so uh, the current form of baits is not quite as effective, but they still do achieve knockdowns in a local rabbit population, and there's a new one hopefully coming through in the next year or so, um, the new RHDV strain, which is called K5. And uh, yeah, 